Welcome to In The Funnel. My name is Mark Cox. In The Funnel is a group of sales coaches and consultants that help B2B sales teams dramatically improve revenue. Clients come to us when revenue growth is stagnated, or their sales team is not meeting expectations, or they need to recalibrate their sales and go-to-market plan for the upcoming year. Our clients have enjoyed tremendous success working within the funnel. And please, hear it straight from them by listening to the testimonial section of this website. What they'll tell you is there's two things that make us unique and different in our space. Number one, we have a process and a methodology. First, for understanding your current state. And then second, for building your sales and go-to-market plan for the upcoming year. The second thing that makes us unique and different is that everybody within the funnel has run a material sales organization in their recent past. We're all practitioners. We don't have any theorists or teachers. And what that means is we can get in front of your sales team and run the next sales meeting or join them on their next sales call to close your next large prospect. All of us have a passion for professional, disciplined, process-driven sales, and we'd be delighted to talk to you if you're looking to grow revenue for your company. Please feel free to reach out to us through this website at info at inthefunnel.com or by telephone. Thanks for taking the time to watch this. So the first thing that's most critical when selecting or deciding whether or not to go through a channel is where is your product in the adoption life cycle? For those of you who are fans of Jeffrey Moore and crossing the chasm, yeah. um, if your product is really early, kind of in the new adopter, early you can't adopter, go through a channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't go through a channel. You got to go through a direct sales force. No channel will pick it up. But as that product becomes more and more mature, the kinds of partners you want changes. Mm. Um, in the early stage, you're going to have uh, people like systems integrators who will fix some of the gaps within your product and help it work, make it uh, play friendly with other technologies, for example. Um, then you move to maybe, uh, you know, some, um, you know, uh, uh, more uh, global distributors. Um, and eventually, you know, when a product is very mature, very well known, you're, you're into a transactional sale where you can sell it over, you know, Amazon or, or some online process. So as a product changes, a few things change along with it. The kind of sales cycle, is it a long complex or is it a, here's the price and buy? the skill sets of the channel that you need to sell it, um, the um, margin associated mm. with the product and therefore the compensation that you give the channel. Yeah. Um, so that's really the first starting point is where is our product within the market now? A market in Canada or in the US might be different. Um, and things change based on market maturity the scale, mm. you know, how big is that market, right? And so those are things that you need to look at. And culture, by the way, how do you sell um, are the three big determinants about, should I go through a channel? What kind of a channel do I need? How am I going to manage them? What kind of compensation and support do I need to give them? Hey, folks, that was Greg Nutter. He's the principal consultant and the founder of Soliquent Inc., He's also the author of a great new book, P3 Selling, The Essentials of B2B Sales Success. And in today's discussion, we are talking to another sales thought leader here who at some point in time in his career had foundational, exceptional sales training. There's so many of these folks who appear on the Selling Well podcast of a certain age, my age, that actually went through sales training with Xerox or IBM or Kodak or Motorola. But in those days, the training lasted months and it was ongoing. It wasn't a one-time event. And the sales management was all on side with the training. So they reinforced it. Uh, Greg's going to tell us about that journey and how we got to where he is today. 
We are going to talk about the book, P3 Selling, and three Ps are problems, people, and processes. And we have great conversation about the importance of the same for sales management. In addition, we talk about uh, a topic that isn't actually something we've covered too many times on the Selling Well so far. We talk about channel management because Greg spent some time as the practice lead for Miller Hyman in channel management. And we'll talk about how as a business you decide whether this is right for you. What, what are the things you need to think about? Are there some specifics about your business, your solution, the geographies you're in, the, you know, the, the clients you sell to? We'll really touch on this topic of channel management, and I'm sure we'll come back to it in later podcasts. I really enjoyed speaking with Greg today. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And if you do, as usual, please like and subscribe to the Selling Well podcast. Here's Greg Nutter. Hey, Greg, welcome to the Selling Well podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Mark, thanks very much for having me. And Mr. David Fowser, as always, it's terrific to have you here as our partner in crime. Thank you for joining. Yeah, it's, I'm really excited about today, actually, Mark. I've been doing a bit of research on you, Greg, and, uh, and it sounds like you've got a really practical approach here to uh, today's selling world. So I'm really looking forward to learning more from you. Great. Thanks, David. So, so, Greg, one of the things um, we always love with the guests on the show is we love to give a little bit of context, kind of the short story on your journey in professional sales. And I know you got your ticket stamped with one of the big organizations early on in your career, but tell us a little bit about your journey that got you here. Sure. Um, I started off like a lot of salespeople, um, telephone sales, a little company. Um, if you don't sell, you don't eat or pay the rent <laughs> this week, right? A uh, company had no sales training and then they survived by, <clears throat> if you made it, you stayed. And if you didn't, you left pretty quickly. So uh, I did that for about seven or eight years and did well. Uh, many didn't. Um, so it kind of opened my eyes to a little bit about what selling is and how much I didn't know. Um, from there, I was fortunate to join uh, Xerox. Great. And uh, selling their printing systems and software. I uh, was a sales rep, sales manager, uh, sales trainer, uh, and ultimately a general manager of a major accounts team. And night and day, you know, Xerox was... You know, back in the day, the you know one of the top sales training organizations. There's all kinds of really good uh, training methodologies and good sales management processes. And you know, the light went on about, hey, this is much more of a science and a process than just winging it where I came from. Um, after that, I went back and forth from some companies, little companies who knew nothing about sales but were just winging it, <laughs> and others who had some good processes. And I think it was through that journey that I started realizing the power of, of uh, good sales training mm -hmm. and how few people actually had it. And even if they had it, it wasn't being reinforced or supported by their management. And therefore, they weren't using it. What a great point, by the way, not being reinforced by the management. So it dissipates. And, and it's amazing to me, um, guys, how many of the you know, kind of 100 top sales thought leaders in the world or 200, how many of them actually went through either Xerox's training or IBM's training or Kodak mm -hmm. or Motorola kind of 20 years ago, yep. back when there was sales training, proper sales training provided by an organization. And you said sales training, you, you were a sales trainer for Xerox. Were you teaching down in Leesburg at one point? No. I didn't do that. I was a field trainer. So I would field. go on calls awesome. uh, and watch. Back in the day, we did something called spin ticking, um, where for those of you who know uh, Neil Rackham's book, Spin, we would count the number of situation questions, problem questions, application questions, need payoff. Um, but you started to see kind of how an organized structured process would pay off in a sales call, how things worked or didn't work. Yeah. Um, very method methodical. And by the way, even today, 
you know, outside of a handful, no one's ever done the research that uh, Dr. Neil Rackham did with spin selling. Yeah. Yep. I mean, in today's dollars, that's kind of a couple million dollars, maybe more of, uh, I forget the number, but it was something shocking, like, and forgive me if this number's wrong, everybody, but it was like 60,000 sales calls. Like it was mm -hmm. over multiple, multiple years. No one would ever invest in that again. Although now it's easier, you can actually do it through analyzing Zoom sales calls and everything else. But all of that is still highly relevant today and, oh, and just spectacular. So, so I know you've had a, an amazing career since the Xerox days. So I've seen a lot of different businesses. We're going to talk about your book, um, P3 Selling, in a minute. But, but you know, um, I'll, I'll ask this to both of you, by the way. Um, a great question for both of you, but, you know, given the fact that we're facing these headwinds, eight to 10% inflation, we've now been talking about that, by the way, for six, seven months. So now we're starting to see some impacts in the market. We've seen the impacts of the multiple price increases with COVID and uh, channel issues and so on, logistics issues and so forth. What would you say, Greg, is the biggest unexploited opportunity driven by some of the challenges we're facing with the, these economic tailwinds coming our way. I always mm. believe that it, when any time there's a crisis, there's a huge opportunity. And so given these financial markets, where do you see the opportunity for those of us in professional B2B sales? And then Mr. Fowser, over to you with the same question. Yeah. Great, great question. Um, I think the opportunity is something I contrast in the first part of my book. I talk about the difference between clerking and selling, right? Okay. So clerking is a B2C sales motion uh, where we give information we ask for the order, right? Which is doesn't work as well in B2B. Um, but my guess is that we would win probably 20, 25% of the deals by clerking. I tell you about my product and then I ask for the order. I give you a price and I ask for the order. I tell you how uh, Gartner or some other analyst thinks about my product and they ask for the order, right? Um, and that wins in certain instances, but with a more challenging sales environment, uh, I think it'll win less. And the, the really good salespeople and selling, in my opinion, is all about creating awareness around the need to act that skill set is going to be much more valuable and I think is going to earn more than 80% of the deals. Well, well, I think that leads to just a wonderful kind of opportunity. You know, that's, that's an opportunity presented, I think, Greg, just, just given the financial markets, but frankly, it's just an opportunity in professional sales in general. Hmm. Um, your thoughts, David? Yeah, so yeah, so Mark, Mark um, agreed with what Greg has said, uh, very insightful. And I, I, I think for me, with the, the midst of all this complexity and all this inflation and, and, and all this information that people have, it's about bringing value. It's like seems to be circling back to bringing that value and really focusing on the customer as opposed to focusing on yourself. And I think that that to me seems to be at the nucleus of what the skills that we need to bring to the table, we need to bring value because I can't believe how fast these meetings are sort of ending in, if you're not bringing it. And, and it's complicated, you gotta be thinking uh, in the eyes of your customer. And that skill is more needed today than I think ever before, in my opinion. And, and if I can build on top of what you just said, David, is um, I think it requires a change in role. The typical role, if you ask a salesperson, B2B salesperson and say, what is your role today? as perceived by your customer. They'll come up generally with two, uh, two answers. One is, I'm the relationship manager. I manage the relationship between my company and uh, the customer. The other one option I hear a lot is, well, I'm the product expert. I know about the product and how it applies. But to deliver value, exactly what you said, David, I think the transition needs to be someone who's an expert on the buying decision process. Notice I didn't say the selling process. I said the buying process, the customer's buying process, because customers are struggling too to make purchasing decisions. They're more complex, there's more people involved, uh, there's more risk associated with them. 
And so being able to come and add value to them around how do I make good buying decisions more efficiently to me is huge value for companies today. Well, they've heard us on this show a number of times, Greg, talk about, you know, the Gardner spaghetti diagram when they did their, <laughs> you know, their, buy, their buying process. And it's not serial or linear. It goes all over the place. Mm. And, and so, you know, that's one of the things that we see today. And then a couple of weeks back, we, we in, in different cases, we had each of the fellows who wrote the Challenger sale from 10 years ago, Matt Dixon and Brent Adamson. And it's interesting, they, they work separately now. Um, CEB got bought by, um, they got bought by Gardner, actually. But Matt Dixon's new book is called The Jolt Effect. And what he's talking about is there are these, uh, the number of deals that go to no decision right now, mm. you know, as being a real key issue out there because of exactly what you brought up. You know, if we can't really just lead with value only from the client's perspective, um, if we're not taking that approach, then we can't help them make better decisions. And frankly, they just get overwhelmed by the amount of information out there. And it's pretty clear in his book, he talks about it being pretty clear that it's easy to unseat the status quo, but it's a lot of other work to, to get through their indecision. Those are two mm -hmm. different things. Unseating a uh, status quo is building up fear. Um, helping them get through their indecision is reducing fear. And I really like the approach you talk about. I, I think in professional sales today, if we were training salespeople to get away from the 50-year-old version of the bad stereotype of selling and say, I'm going to pitch or I've got to get my script and everything else and just say, all we do is solve problems for a customer or a client mm -hmm. and train them actually on diagnosing the problem, identifying the problem, having a point of view as to what the solution could look like for the problem. Then every time we interact with them, try and add some value then you do what you would have done all those times with Xerox. Eventually, you're just viewed as a strategic advisor to that client. Right. You know, right. when Dan, Dan Pink was on the show and he was talking about his stuff. And at the end, I said, what's going on in sales? He said, sales is management consulting. It's got the wrong title. <laughs> it's management consulting where you get in to solve that problem. Right. So, so I think you're really, really on to something there. Um, tell me, I want to talk a little bit about the book P3 Selling, and I love the, the three P's, problems, people, processes, but what prompted you to take on the task of writing a book? Because I'm in the middle of it, and boy, oh boy, I'm wondering whether I should have started down this path. Boy, is it tough. So congratulations, but what prompted you to do that? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yes, it is a lot of work for sure. Um, I guess, like, a lot of us, uh, we've been around a long time. Uh, we've seen a lot of salespeople, sales uh, management, um, and some are very successful and some aren't. Um, and just before I wrote the book, I was uh, in a fractional, uh, had a sales role and was coaching some salespeople. And I was just shocked by how many people had been at it for so long and forgotten what to do. And so I wanted something where I could say, here, just read my book, <laughs> right? Right. Instead of, instead of telling them. Um, and so it's interesting. I went through a transition. When I first started writing the book, I thought, okay, this is for people who come out of school, get hired into a small job, a small company like I did, no sales training, given a list of people to call and said, go, you know, <laughs> let me know when you got an order, right? Hard work, hard work. Right. So where well, they don't know what to do. So that was my first vision of the book. Give people fundamentals, process, some tactics and strategies to be successful. And then as I went on, I realized there's a lot of people who've been around a while, but have forgotten, just like I was speaking about, um, forgotten the fundamentals. They're back to pitch and product. And it was a refresher designed as a refresher for them. Nice. Right. They fall into a, a a rut. How do I get out of that rut? How do I get my game back on? And then just at the end, I realized there's a lot of sales managers um, who've been promoted from sales reps, who maybe were really good at sellers, 
but weren't given good sales management tools mm. or process or foundation. So the book also carry, uh, caters to them. It gives them a framework, a set of processes, some tools that they can use to manage their team. Um, and so that was the, uh, the end point. And I've been getting some really good feedback by both sellers and uh, sales managers that it seems to be on mark. So pretty happy about that. Well, well done. I, I noticed that, by the way, in, in preparing for today, there's a lot of great reviews on the book. And by the way, that that um, we've talked a lot about that evolution from, you know, the Wayne Gretzky of the sales team to becoming a sales manager. We've talked about that a lot on the podcast, Greg. I lived through that, you know, making that transition with little or no training and being miserable in the new role and making my team miserable at the same time. <laughs> it was shocking. It was shocking how quickly everybody involved in it was miserable because of my behavior. So it's actually not an easy transition to make. And, and I think today, you know, some of the unique things about our environments today is we're, we're in the same world where almost one in two um, professional salespeople out there have not received any training whatsoever. Although there's 70 to 80 billion spent in the US on training every year. Um, I haven't got the breakdown of this number, but a very, very small portion of that, in my view, is sales management training. Yes. And I, I think there's- 100% agree. I think there's there's two core reasons for it. One is, um, first of all, I think most of us uh, don't always see the need for our own training. So- we may take over a sales organization and go, boy, the team's a bit rough here. I'm going to put them through training. But the sales manager rarely looks in the mirror and says, I need training. And then the second thing is, I think there's a reason they don't do that. They're afraid that sitting around the executive team table uh, in a mid-sized company, if they do put their hand up for some training, they think it's a shortcoming of themselves, which it is absolutely not a shortcoming. Hmm. But, but I, don't, I think there's a vulnerability aspect of it. And we always make the analogy that the Toronto Maple Leafs, you and I are both Canadians, both Torontonians, <laughs> awesome, by originally. There, there's, there's five coaches for professional hockey players. The head coach, a fitness coach, a shooting coach, a strategy coach, a mindset coach, a nutrition coach. So, so you get some experts along different areas to help coach the team. But, but I don't think all, all sales leaders today are comfortable bringing that help in from the outside. And by the way, it might be one of the reasons that a chief revenue officer lasts less than two years, according to Gardner. Uh, absolutely. And the, the thing I've noticed, you know, we talked about, you know, there's three successes when it comes to scaling a sales team. First one, first is sales process. Now, certainly you need some skill and some art on top of that, but you need some foundational processes. In my book, I talk about the four fundamentals, which is prospecting, call management, deal management, pipeline management, right? Nice. If you can't do those four well, you're in trouble. Great. The second most important thing to scale a team is management processes. So the management needs to understand what do they do in a one-on-one? -on -one? What do they do in a team meeting? What do they do on a joint call? What do they do in a QBR, right? So what are the fundamentals? And those are the things, Mark, you pointed out that a lot of people don't, you haven't given training on, aren't structured to do. And, and the job of sales management, in my opinion, and my experience is more process oriented than a sales rep, mm. right? It's less about art. <laughs> Certainly there's some art around how do you give coaching, mm -hmm. which isn't, hey, I'd like to give you some coaching, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's a lot of selling, which is creating awareness, yeah, asking good questions. So uh, the light bulb goes on. You see, there's a light bulb in the cover of my book, which is to me is what selling is. It's about creating light bulb moments, awareness of the need to change. And, and sales managers need that certainly as a, skill, but also a process. And without that, you can't scale a team. Well, without that, I think, Greg, and you're so spot on. It sounds so simple, by the way, when you say it this way, because your, your book's well thought out, your process is well thought out, your methodology looks easy. But, but it, 
you know, it's so hard to do in practical execution. And it's almost impossible if you don't have those processes as a sales leader, as you say, because in the absence of that management cadence that you've spoken of, what happens is you're firefighting with your team all the time. You got the right. open door. You know, you and I come across a lot of folks. Oh, I've got an open door policy. The open door policy allows people to pop their head in, ask a question. The sales manager answers it as a reflex, thereby diminishing the sales IQ of the salesperson because it's a coaching <laughs> moment. They don't do it. They just tell them what to do. And what that means is next time they're going to pop in with two questions. And then they're mm -hmm. going to pop in with three questions. And all you're doing is answering questions that they should be capable of doing and developing on their own. And they're not going to like their job of asking you questions all the time. Yep. Great, so, great, great point. So I like this idea because you and I both act as kind of interim chief revenue officers as part of our various responsibilities in different companies we work with. It's completely overwhelming. If you don't have a management cadence in place, all you're doing is that. And it's yep. no, no fun for you, no fun for the reps. Yeah, I, I was uh, spent some time coaching a couple of uh, directors of sales. And we were you know, looking at the one-on-one -on -one process. And I said, you need to follow this process. And they get ambushed. Because if you're a sales rep, smart sales rep, who's got a terrible pipeline, <laughs> problems, right? Not making the calls, whatever. You came in and say, oh, I'd love to talk about pipeline. But before we do, I really want to get your advice on this deal. Can we spend some time on this deal? And the sales manager drops everything or the director yeah. of sales drops everything, sure. focuses on the deal. And so the rep, smart rep, just derailed the whole one-on-one -on -one, and they spent all the time talking about the deal. <laughs> and we didn't realize that that rep wasn't making calls, had a terrible pipeline, was not going to make his numbers because we ended up all the time on a deal. So that's why consistency, you know, if someone says, Hey, we've got to talk about this deal. No problem. Let's set up a time for next, uh, for Tuesday and we'll do it then, but don't get derailed on your process. Cause then you're asking for trouble. That is the exact process I went through from the ages of age eight to 11 where I had a piano teacher who was the loveliest gentleman in the world, but didn't write anything down. And every week he asked me, where did we get last time? <laughs> so, so over three years, we kept playing the same sonata, you know, the, fantastically. And then it switched over to a new person who first thing she did was she gave me a notebook and she said, every time we have a lesson, we're going to write down in this <laughs> notebook, what you have to do before ne next week, and I remember leaving that lesson when I was great and 11 years old going, uh oh, this whole thing just changed. I better yep. get comfortable practicing piano. There's nowhere to go now. Yeah. And now it still didn't work out. Uh, that's why I do this for a living. However, it could have with, a, with someone with more talent that that whole process could have worked a lot better. So, so Greg, um, this, this topic of sales management, again, amazing. The folks who have lived through these major organizations that had a sales culture. Thank you, IBM. Thank you, Xerox. Thank you, Motorola, Kodak, all the rest of them. You know, it is that structure, process, methodology that enabled leaders to do the three things they have to do. There is inspection in sales management. We get it. Got to be inspection. But there's also got to be intentional coaching and then motivation. Those are these, in my view, kind of this magic. Uh, kind of kind of um, job description for an effective sales leader if we want to elevate the performance of the team and actually engage them because it's harder, but the team will actually appreciate that. We could talk for hours and everybody listening to this who runs a sales team understands how difficult it is. But I think the short answer for everyone out there is you're likely not doing enough effective coaching according <laughs> to the statistics. And so thinking forward about your, your cadence on a weekly basis, where do we fit that time in to really calmly uh, and confidently coach our team? So, so lessons for all of us. But Greg, so we're going to talk a little more about P, uh, P3 selling on the back end here. I did want to pick your brain, though, on a topic we have not discussed on this podcast frequently, which is channel management. 
and channel strategy. And I know at some point in time in your career, you were the executive director over at Miller Hyman leading this practice. I, I think, first of all, a lot of folks listening to this call, whether they're CEOs or sales leaders, they're always wondering, you know, when and if they should actually execute a channel strategy, a partner strategy. Let's talk a little bit about that. I bet in your Miller Hyman days, you got brought in a lot to assess an environment to help them decide, was it a direct sales approach or is it a channel approach? Can we talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. In fact, before I took over the channel management practice at Miller Hyman, I was with a company called Channel Enablers and I was with them for seven or eight years and that their intellectual property, their practice was purchased by Miller Hyman. Oh, uh, which, nice. Which is how I transitioned into Miller Hyman to kind of uh, manage that practice globally. Um, you ask a great question. I have seen it's, a lot of companies struggle with channels. Um, and I'm certainly, Mark, and maybe a lot of your listeners, people who've done it and done it right, um, make a lot of money out of it. Um, but the nuance to it is really different. It's um, it's like two different swings. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we we talked at one point about how you know it's it's like a, a baseball swing, <laughs> or is it a golf swing? Um, both are designed to take a, a small ball and move it a long distance in a straight line, right? But if you use one in the wrong circumstances, you're not going to be very successful. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting what you we talked about just before this, which is around management. Channel management is exactly that. It's a management job. Mm. And therefore, just like a sales manager, it's heavily process oriented. Mm. Um, and again, um, you need to have a process on how you recruit your partners, how you onboard them, how you manage them, how you, you know, drive performance to them. And, and I would say, again, it's even, um, it has some selling to it for sure. Uh, and some coaching to it, but it's a lot of, a lot of process. So when do you do it? I think you do it when you understand kind of what it is and what's involved. Mm. Um, a lot of people look at it and say, hey, if I could just get IBM or SAP yeah, or right. some big company to sell my stuff, I'd make a fortune, right? Sure they would. Um, but that's hard to do. It's hard to scale. And so sometimes, depending on where you are, you, you start at a different place. Um, the other um, mystery around channels is that um, you think, hey, it's free. I got somebody else selling my stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say it's not free. There's some cost to it. The cost of setting it up all comes up front. Um, it's not linear like a sales rep. You had a sales rep, you should get an extra million dollars in sales, add another sales rep, an extra million dollars in sales. Um, but it, it's something where it's the costs are front end and designing it, setting up enablement processes, um, onboarding and getting people going. But then there's a big payoff in the in the back end. Um, so whether or not somebody can do it, do they understand what's involved? Do they have the processes in place? Do they have skills in place? Um, are they willing to, to commit it? And it's a culture too. Um, I've worked with some companies who have a really strong, <laughs> we probably both have Mark, um, direct sales culture. Yeah. And uh, they eat at the channel side alive, right? Oh, we're not going to give that to the channel. We're going to keep it ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, it's very different culturally. And an organization needs to understand that and be able to uh, manage those two different cultures, those two different skills, those two different sets of processes. I, I think we see a little bit of both, actually, um, you know, um, Greg, on my end. I see a lot of organizations that maybe uh, believe they have very good solution for the marketplace, but don't believe they have a core competency in sales. And because of the things we've talked about, lack of training, lack of sales leadership, um, you know, a lot of these technology companies, they're technologists who are the CEOs. They didn't grow up in a professional B2B selling environment. 
So in some cases, they'll look at it and say, listen, if I could outsource this, my selling activities to a channel, I can absolve myself of the need to be able to be good at this function. Our, our experience there has been, you know, it always fails. Unless mm -hmm. in that instance, if you're not setting up the processes, methodologies, the strategies, all those things you spoke of, that type of channel will only order take. They'll do the, right. some of the clerking you talked about at the beginning. But, but a lot of these startups have no name recognition within the large account. So you actually need channels who understand the offering and can actually solution sell. And that in itself is a big problem. That doesn't exist either or, or not consistently. Are there any absolutes when you used to come in and take a look at a company? For example, you know, certain businesses um, you know, are more suitable for channel sales, whether it's hardware, software, services, manufacturing, whatever it is. Is there a size and scale of either the solution, you know, the offering or the market, you know, that they're selling into the size and scale of the available target market and maybe even the buying process, you know, complex versus a simple sale, any thoughts or counsel, or does it always just depend? It does depend on a couple things. So the first thing that's most critical when selecting or deciding whether or not to go through a channel is where is your product in the adoption life cycle? For those of you who are fans of Jeffrey Moore and crossing the chasm, yeah. um, if your product is really early, kind of in the new adopter, early you can't adopter, go through a channel. Yeah, 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 you can't go through a channel. You got to go through a direct sales force. No channel will pick it up. But as that product becomes more and more mature, the kinds of partners you want changes. Mm. Um, in the early stage, you're gonna have uh, people like systems integrators who will fix some of the gaps within your product and help it work, make it uh, play friendly with other technologies, for example. Um, then you move to maybe, uh, you know, some, um, you know, uh, uh, more uh, global distributors. Um, and eventually, you know, when a product is very mature, very well known, you're, you're into a transactional sale where you can sell it over, you know, Amazon or, or some online process. So as a product changes, a few things change along with it. The kind of sales cycle, is it a long complex or is it a, here's the price and buy, the skill sets of the channel that you need to sell it, um, the, um, margin associated mm. with the product and therefore the compensation that you give the channel. Yeah. Um, so that's really the first starting point is where is our product within the market now? A market in Canada or in the US might be different. Um, and things change based on market maturity, the scale, you know, how big is that market, right? And so those are things that you need to look at. And culture, by the way, how do you sell? Um, are the three big determinants about, should I go through a channel? What kind of a channel do I need? How am I going to manage them? What kind of compensation and support do I need to give them? So really important considerations before you decide, should I, should I go down this channel path? Well, well, I think the thank you, Greg. I think the key learning for everybody here today is a lot of times we think of channel sales because we we actually think it's less work. No chance. There's no <laughs> chance. I'd rather the, the difference for me if I'm a CRO is the one thing I look at, whether my direct sales organization or a channel, at least I have some form of control. Not a lot, but I have some form of control over my direct sales organization. You have no control over a channel almost no control over channels. So it, it is a management job, but it's exponentially more difficult because that channel is not selling your product exclusively. They're doing lots of other things. So controlling behaviors or having them execute on your sales and go to market plan, extraordinarily difficult unless selling your offering is crazy easy. Yeah. So, so 100% right. Yeah, 100% right, Mike. A sales manager can get a, a lot done just by telling the reps what to do. Now, in this day and age, a lot of good reps will just quit, you know, if that's the management style. But you cannot tell a channel what to do, right? right. 
So there's a lot more selling. There's a lot more influence. There's a lot more coaching, creating awareness, um, which makes it much more of a nuanced job than just a brute force, um, which which some of us try to do in a in a direct selling selling environment. Hey, Greg. Both of us have been have been at this a while. Clearly, we still have this, you know, passion for for what's going on in professional B two B selling. Um, we would also both see lots of new people entering this discipline, and maybe different from back in the day when we did it. I know right. people on this podcast know I kind of fell into this and maybe wasn't super proud of my profession for a few years and until I really understood what it was and then you know then became enormously proud once a whole bunch of other options presented themselves I realized this was it what would your advice or counsel be to people listening today who are on the front end of their career and they've just jumped into s- professional sales um, a lot of folks listening to this sell technology many of them sell you know, man, there's manufacturing businesses and services businesses, professional services businesses. But what would be what would be some of your coaching to young people in the profession today? Good question. Um, as you you know, Mark, and a lot of people, a lot of your listeners know, um, selling can be both um, very lucrative, great career, makes a lot of money, and it can also have a high degree of satisfaction. You're helping people, helping companies solve problems. But there's a lot of researchers today that will say that the number of salespeople that we need in five years, 10 years, 20 years time, we need a whole lot less. And you go, well, why do we need less? People are still going to buy. The reason is because we don't need the clerks anymore. Hmm. Computer technology, artificial intelligence, websites can do a far better job of giving product information. Uh, giving all kinds of analysts, doing comparisons with competitions, running demos, Mm -hmm. right? They can do a whole lot of this product information work that a lot of sales reps do. And so when you don't no longer need to talk about your product, there's a whole lot of sales reps that you don't need anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So I would tell people today that if you like selling, you want to be good at selling, you want to move up the ladder at selling, then you need to know how to do it to use your uh, backdrop there. You need to how to do it well. You need to know how to manage a call, ask good questions, create awareness, uh, change perceptions, influence perceptions, and manage com- uh, customers through the buying process. And if you can do that, your job's not going away. If all you can do is give product and ask for the order, artificial intelligence can do that far better than you can. And they do it 24 hours a day for a lot less money, right? So that would be my advice is that uh, get good at it uh, before you find yourself in a situation where we, we don't need that job anymore. Hmm. Got it. Thanks, Greg. And, and last question on my end, and, and then we're going to pass it over to you so that you can let people know how to learn more about you and P3 selling and all those kind of good things. But outside of your great book you're just releasing, um, what are you reading today in professional sales? What's good out there that you're reading for the folks listening today to go and go and take a run out outside of your book? <laughs> That's a great question, and I don't have a great answer for you because when That's I started okay. it, when I started it, I kind of looked at all the, you know, uh, the sales training I'd been on, and I stopped looking at uh, books. Certainly, you know, uh, ten years ago when it came out, the Challenger Sale was an excellent resource. Forty years when it came out, um, Spin Selling, uh, Strategic Selling by Miller Hyman, still very relevant. Still great, still great. Yeah. Um, and so I looked at those, and to be honest, I haven't found many books today that um, really have changed my outlook on what the foundational processes are, right? The key success factors. And so um, I, I, I can't say that there are some. 
right? Other than the classics that we just talked about. Well, well, listen, maybe that's why you wrote your book. And by the way, so so good on you. That's something I haven't been able to accomplish yet. And and so um, also, I always give a lot of kudos to those classics you mentioned. You know, Miller Hyman Strategic Selling, which was about 1989. Mm. Frankly, it, you know, 60% of most sales books today will reference some form of complex sale, multiple people influence the decision. They have their own personal wants and professional wants. That's Miller Hyman strategic selling. It's just yep. positioned slightly different for today's generation. That was core fundamental. Yep. So I think that's great. I absolutely still believe that some of Dr. Neil Rackham's questions in spin selling, that's a great thing to pick up if you're in sales today, because you're always looking for amazing questions they're about helping that client get to a better future. And those questions that Neil talked about, the forming of the question, fantastic. Uh, so a lot of those fundamentals are still very good today. And here's where everybody listening to this podcast is going to roll their eyes. But no joke, I did a discovery with a new uh, client recently. And I kept writing in my book that they needed to read Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people. There's a reason it's been on the nonfiction bestseller list for 70 years or 80 years. It's fantastic. So folks out there today, if you're in sales and you have not read that book, trust me, it's not crazy dated. We're not going to be tell talking about selling sheepskin or something of this nature. <laughs> Believe me, it's fantastic. It's a great read and some good fundamentals. Hey, Greg, obviously, we got a huge soft spot for Canadians, um, you, you, you know, on this show. So I know you're based in San Diego, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the Selling Well podcast. Folks listening today are going to want to learn more about you and they're going to want to buy the book P3 Selling. How do they learn more about you and your business and how do they find the book? Uh, so first, if you want to know a little bit more about P3 Selling, you go to, to uh, my website, www.p3selling.com. Uh, if you want to know more about me and uh, work I've done prior to writing the book, you can go to my website, which is on, which is called soloquent.com, S-O-L-O-Q-U-E-N-T. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, my name, or there's also P3 Selling on you know, LinkedIn. And lastly, you can buy the book on pretty well any um, online bookseller in the world. I've sold the book in India, and <laughs> Brazil and Netherlands and UK and uh, Japan and probably Australia, pretty well everywhere. So Way if, to you've go. Got a, if you've uh, got internet, you can find it. Way to go. That's awesome. Hey, listen, I'm Greg. Thank you again for joining today. And folks, thank you all for joining today. You're going to notice we lost Dave Fowser in process here today, because guess what? You know, even during a podcast, big deals go down. So, so that's <laughs> why Dave had to had to leave us today. So, uh, good th send good vibes toward Dave. But I did want to thank everybody for listening to the podcast here today. And if you liked what you heard, please like and subscribe to the Selling Well podcast. Also, remember, we love constructive criticism. So if you've got some thoughts or ideas for us about how we could improve this podcast, or you have ideas of people we should be interviewing, we're happy to reach out to them, put them on the show. We exist so that we can help improve the performance and professionalism of B2B sales and enable you with strategies, processes, or tools that you can apply after listening to this podcast today. So that's the goal. If we're getting there, let us know. If there's things we can do to improve, let us know that too. And you can reach out to me directly. My personal email is markcox at inthefunnel.com. I check that email and I love constructive criticism. All of Greg's links will be in the show notes here today, folks. And thank you again for joining. We'll see everybody next week.